and open up to the book of Jonah. We're going to read Jonah chapter 3 before uh, we look at our text in the Gospel of Luke. Let me say at the outset that the message today will be quite shorter than normal. Um, anticipation for the meeting that we were supposed to have today and wanting to devote some time to that meeting. Uh, my message is probably half as long as normal. I, uh, did not see the need to change it necessarily just because at the last minute we, we put off the, the meeting. And I trust it will still be useful. Mm. Um, our text is in Luke, but I'd like to read Jonah chapter 3, which is where we are, and then we'll read the corresponding text in the Gospel of Luke. So first of all, Jonah chapter 3, and beginning at verse 4. Mm. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. And then turn over to the Gospel of Luke, if you would. Luke chapter 11, which recounts very briefly, what happened in Nineveh. Mm -hmm. There is an ongoing discussion, accusations, and the Jewish people are demanding a sign from the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And then we pick up the reading in chapter 11 of Luke, verse 29. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation mm. and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The title of the message this afternoon is The Sign of the Ninevites. The Sign of the Ninevites. And notice I did not say the sign of the prophet Jonah. Before I explain the title, of course, the sign of the prophet Jonah, the Lord Jesus Christ, we've gone over that several times. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale and lay there for three days and three nights and then came back to life, so the Lord Jesus Christ was three days in the heart of the earth. And the Lord, in the Matthew account, um, the Lord explains that the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was that spiritual picture and fulfillment of the sign of Jonah. But today I'd like to talk very briefly with you about the sign of the Ninevites. And I derive that title from a, in part, from a statement that Matthew Henry made when he was commenting upon Jonah. And Matthew Henry asks this question and he gives an answer. After he talks about the sign 
of the prophet Jonah, then he says, what is the sign that God expects from us for the evidencing of our faith? Mm. What is the sign that we in fact, like the Ninevites, meant mm. what we believed, what we said? And he gives the answer. The answer is a serious practice of that religion which we profess to believe. So the thinking is this, God gave the Ninevites a sign. The Ninevites were given the sign of the prophet Jonah, a miraculous, grace-filled, tremendous sign that among other things spoke about the divinity of God, his existence, and very specifically his hatred for sin. And of course, Nineveh was filled with violence, perhaps their major sin, but all other sin as well. And God would have an ultimate judgment, and in Nineveh's case, a 40-day away judgment upon Nineveh for their sin. Jonah came to them as a sign, more than likely recounting what happened to him in the belly of the whale, preaching to them that in 40 days God would overthrow Nineveh. And that sign to the Ninevites we could characterize as being highly significant, startling, godlike, foreign to their society and their culture, an epic moment. And we could characterize the spiritual nature of that sign, the sign of the prophet Jonah, to the New Testament church, us, as well as to those that our Lord spoke to as highly significant, epic, godlike, miraculous. And God gave the Jewish nation this sign, this religious crowd that Jesus was the fulfillment of the sign of the prophet Jonah. That he alone would complete not some fleshly carnal miracle to prove that he was God, he would come and prove contrary to what the Jewish nation had come to believe, the reality of true spiritual religion, the spiritual essence of a relationship with God, and of course, he, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so then we can ask ourselves, like Matthew Henry asked, what is the sign, like Nineveh became a sign to those, that generation, Nineveh became a sign to God, as it were, that they actually believed what God said. And they were serious about what they were professing to believe. And so I'd like to look at the sign of the Ninevites with you this afternoon briefly. A five-fold sign that the Ninevites became. And then I would like to look at what the New Testament believer, that is us, what kind of a sign we should be to the Lord. So fivefold sign of the Ninevites. The Ninevites became a sign to God, God who is a searcher of the hearts. And the Ninevites, Jesus said, I mean, Jesus qualified their repentance. He qualified their belief and said, it's the real deal. It's genuine. And he went so far as to say, they will rise up in the judgment and condemn those who had Jesus preaching in their midst mm -hmm. because they believed, they repented, they did all these things, but the Jewish nation did not. So a five-fold sign of the Ninevites. Mm -hmm. Number one, they believed God. Verse five of chapter three, so the people of Nineveh believed God. By God's mm -hmm. grace, they were enabled to believe and that faith was not an intellectual ascent alone, but their faith had an activity and a life behind it. They believed God's word. They believed God's messenger. And the message was very difficult, was it not? And the messenger, he was no help. Remember, we've, we've gone through kind of briefly the whole story and we know that Jonah is very angry at what God is going to do. But Jonah was no help in delivering this message. And somehow they had the warrant of faith. 
where they had this, this whole soul movement of self-commitment mm. to God. They took God at His word. Mm. And we'll see that this word of God, this seemingly conditional statement is something that God repeats in other places of the scripture. I think we talked about last time that word from Ezekiel where God instructs in Ezekiel, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord. God is swearing by his name, by his existence. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The Ninevites believed. They believed initially at salvation. They went on believing. And to what extent the entire population of Nineveh believed, we do not know. But enough of them did believe. Mm. Where God was that Jesus was able to say, Nineveh, that corporate entity, will rise in a judgment. Believing faith grew, it became stronger, it became resilient, it became persevering. It was a living faith. It was not stagnant, weak, diminishing, languishing. It was a living faith. And for 40 days, their faith was being tested. And God relented, as we'll see next time. But for at least perhaps two generations in Nineveh, they believed God. Second aspect of Nineveh as a sign, they repented from their sin. Perhaps the chief fruit of belief and faith in God is mm -hmm. repentance. Again, Jesus, this is the one Jesus picks out that qualifies their repentance as being accepted mm -hmm. by God. They repented. When we think about repentance, there are three elements to repentance. First of all, there is an intellectual element. That is, we are convicted. Mm -hmm. We know through our conscience, through the light of God's word, mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit, we know we have sinned. It's an acknowledgement that we have sinned. In Nineveh's case, it was violence, and of course, other sins as well. There was this intellectual assent acknowledgement. But it's more than this. It's not just saying, I have sinned, because as you know from the scripture, Pharaoh said, I have sinned. Saul, that first king of Israel, said, I have sinned. Judas said, I have sinned, and I have betrayed innocent blood. It's not just an intellectual element, because secondly, there is an emotional element. There is being contrite, abhorring sin, understanding the reality of, of what sin is, what it does, and its consequences. There is a sorrow for sin. There is this emotion that reacts to sin. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. The sorrow of the world works death, but there is a godly sorrow. And Paul talks about this sorrow when he's speaking to the Corinthians about that, that case of sin, but he, he describes that sorrow as that sorrow working a carefulness and a clearing and an indignation and revenge and zeal and vehement desire to the point where he's able to say, you have cleared yourself in this matter. And then there is a volitional element. There is a change, there is a turning where we abandon sin and we turn to God. And that same language is what the king of Nineveh said. He said, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hand. Mm -hmm. Repentance is a turning from sin unto God, a change of the mind, a change of the will, enabled by grace to forsake sin and turn to God. And repentance is like faith. 
we believe in salvation and we go on believing and we also repent at salvation and we go on repenting forgive us this day uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and even the Apostle Paul as spiritual as man as he was was said that he exercised himself himself to always have a conscience void of offense between God and toward men and so the Ninevites repented they had the intellectual element conviction the emotional element contrition and sorrow and the volitional element turning from and by the grace of God turning to him the Ninevites were a sign unto God that they meant what they said what they believed the third aspect of the sign of the Ninevites reformation change reformation is perhaps a refinement of repentance it's bringing forth fruit meat for repentance it's that whole mindset where they are growing in sanctification where they understand what repentance is all about and they want to get away from that in the sense of being mired in sin but rather growing in holiness and personal piety they wanted to walk in the light and not to fulfill the lust of the flesh they wanted to proactively walk contrary to the world and their own way, old ways and walk in newness of life they wanted to flee temptation they wanted to flee sin and every day there was this this new reformation not as a legalist but as someone who is jealous to maintain their relationship with the Lord there was this understanding of what damage sin does and so they wanted to put away known sin and be on the watch against sin any entrance of sin or temptation and walk in God's ways as best as they were able to with the light that they had the Ninevites were a sign unto God a sign unto the Jewish nation that Christ spoke of a sign unto us that they were serious this commitment that they made with there was serious business and they followed through fourth aspect they had hope in God this is something very very inward Biblical hope not only desires something good for the future, but, but it expects it to happen based on God's word. Biblical hope is, is, is a confidence that it will happen. It's a moral certainty that the good that we expect and, and we desire, that will be done. It's not like I hope this will happen, but the blessed hope that we have been given it's 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 a certain fact someone has said hope is faith in the future mm. these Ninevites who against hope believed in hope the word was dire and they had a very short window to change and they even admitted who can tell if God will relent they did not know but they had enough hope where they could listen to the to the prophet believe his message and follow through as best as they could they might not have had that full assurance of hope until the end like the writer to the Hebrews speaks about but they had hope mm. and hope is an, a necessary aspect or component of faith faith is the substance of things hoped for mm and the evidence of things not seen hope is faith in the future tense and faith and hope go together a strong confidence not just wishful thinking and when we understand the relationship between faith and hope we understand how indispensable hope is we know that we're saved by grace through faith we know that faith is necessary for our salvation. Hope also is essential. Take away hope 
And Paul's definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, becomes destroyed. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. They are there. They're out there. We are not there yet. But it's the evidence of things not seen. Fifth aspect of the sign of the Ninevites was a fear of God. I would suggest from the reading of chapter 3 that they moved with godly fear. They understood the warning. They understood that they should fear not the one who can kill the body only, but the one who can cast body and soul into hell. They had some sense of God's ability to overthrow an entire capital, the capital of Assyria, Nineveh. I believe to some degree Jonah shared his story with them, his waywardness, God casting that storm into the sea, the whale, the three days. I think to some degree they understood the sovereignty of God over creation, over nature, over the affairs of men. They understood something about that that relative to traversing from being an enemy of God to becoming a child of His, they understood something about the S, this, this idea that if, if God will mark iniquity, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with Him that He might be feared. I believe they had this, this healthy reverential fear of God, a fear of offending him, a fear of not knowing him up to this point, and an understanding that God was so big that not only could they never know him entirely in this life, but because of that there had to be this little, this, this component of the fear of God. So these Ninevites, I believe there, there's a sign of the Ninevites, again that quote that, that um, quote from Matthew Henry, uh, although I've changed it, but again he asks this question, what is the sign of the Ninevites? Mm -hmm. What is the sign that God expects from us evidencing our faith? It's a serious practice of that religion which we profess to believe. Again, they believed God, they repented from sin, they reformed themselves, they had hope in God, and they fear, feared God. And all of this was very, very real. On a day-by-day -day basis, it made up their life. And again, Jesus commended the sign of the Ninevites, if you will. He commended their repentance and their belief. It's, it's really an amazing thing if you can, can picture with spiritual sanctified imagination the judgment and, and the Ninevites of all people rising in the judgment on the side of Christ, condemning the religious folks because they had a spiritual reality mm -hmm. And the folks in Jesus' day did not, even though they had Christ in their midst performing miracles and preaching. The Ninevites were assigned. So now, secondly, application. What is the application to us today? What is the sign of the New Testament believer? Answer? It's exactly the same as the sign of the Ninevites. Belief in God repentance, genuine repentance, reformation or sanctification, hope in God, the fear of God. Let's put these five in the context of the New Testament believer. Let's put them for a few minutes in, in, in the, the, the life of Christ Bible Church. Mm. Nineveh had a culture, a society mm -hmm. that had its own peculiarities differences, challenges, as I suppose every society and culture does. 
What about the culture or the society that we find ourselves in? We're not in Nineveh, but we're in the Tri-Valley area in the year 2022. What, what's the society like that we have to contend with? Well, it's a society that has forgotten God. There's a lack of, of, of awareness of God's moving in past history, mm. whether in the world or in our country. There are mm. things that are crowding out God and God's work. Evolution, for example, replacing creation. Some religious liberties are being assaulted. People in general have become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We have idolatry in this culture, idolatry of sports heroes and movie stars and, and music folks. Mm. The society has a redefinition of who God is, mm. if he is at all, a redefinition of church life, worship, there is out there anarchy and, and moral degeneracy and lawlessness. And then most recently, of course, COVID coming in for two years and, and changing and altering, altering what we thought was normal. And Christ Bible Church, our little mini society, um, we have things against us as well. Like, like a lot of churches, we, we have no financial means Right, Peter? No financial means. Uh, we don't have a building. Uh, we don't have a television station. Uh, we're a commuter church, so we have people in, in the North Bay, in the, the, the Central Valley, and in the East Bay, and, and from all over. Uh, we're living in a day of small things. Lots of things against us. I guess at least we're not being martyred or going to jail for our faith. So mm -hmm. we can count our blessings and name them and be thankful for those. But, but we are in a society and in a church where there are, there are peculiarities and there are things that challenge us and, and exercise us. Nevertheless, again, there is a parallel between the sign of the Ninevites and the sign of the New Testament believer. Those five should be overlaid as a template upon us. Belief in God. Belief in God. By God's grace, we were able to believe. And faith is that activity where it, it takes over us, as it were. We believe God's word. We believe God's message. We believe God's message, even if, even if the messenger is ill-equipped. The warrant of faith is still here, where the, the course of, of our soul movement is towards Christ and salvation. Faith, of course, operates on different levels, on different spheres. Mm. Faith worketh by love. When we consider the redeeming love of Christ, we love him because he first loved us. Faith worketh by fear. When we understand that mm. this infinite God, this holy God has been affronted by our sins. We flee for refuge to him. Um, faith understands that we have to look at him that is invisible, realizing his reality, that he is the reality. Faith looks at the vanity of life and says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Mm. And for the New Testament Christian, there's this ongoing living aspect of faith. Faith works. Faith serves. Faith gives. Faith sacrifices. Faith loves. Faith pleases God. Faith obeys. Faith believes promises. Faith prays. Faith obtains a good report. Does your faith obtain a good report? As it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, 
Does your faith obtain a good report like the Ninevites obtained a good report, at least from the Lord Jesus Christ? The sign of the New Testament believer that God expects from us that evidences our faith is the serious practice of what we say, what we profess to believe, believing God with an active, living, growing faith. Like the Ninevites, part of our sign to God is repentance from mm. sin, that goodness of God that leads us to repentance, an understanding of what sin has done and what it will do if it is not cut off from us. Forecasting the possible result of Timothy's ministry in the turning of the wicked to, to God, Paul told Timothy, perhaps God will, peradventure, give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. That, that idea points it to it exactly, repentance and the acknowledging of the truth involving each other, closely linked together. together. Again, Jesus said the Ninevites repented to the point that they were absolved. They were that sign. Remember, we spoke of, re of repentance with those three elements. It's an intellectual element, the conviction, the knowledge of what sin is and that we ourselves have committed it. There's that emotional element where we're sorry for sin, we want to abhor sin, there's a reaction against sin, and that volitional element where we turn from sin. When the king of Nineveh spoke to the Ninevites, he said, turn everyone from his evil way that lifestyle of evil, that lifestyle of violence, of uh, that sin that was in their hands. It was in their hands they were guilty of doing it. Turning unto God. Repentance follows faith in the sense that if we really believe what God says about sin, its danger, its destroying nature, how it deforms us, the grief and the hatred, and that volitional element has to arise because we're not stagnant relative to sin. I mentioned that uh, the Pharaoh and Saul and Judas all said, I have sinned. But they didn't have that volitional element. Saul said, I, you know what? He said, I played the fool exceedingly. His pride was hurt. That's the only reason he said he was sin. Judas had, had this miss, if we were to, to try to be charitable to him as the betrayer of our Lord, we could say he was, at, at, at the least, he was misdirected in what he thought he was bringing about. Of course, he was doing it, I believe, clearly on purpose, selling the Lord, and he knew what was going to happen. Pharaoh had this pride that was hurt. And that's why he said he had sinned uh, through his ignorance and standing God off the land of Egypt was ruined. And that's when he said, I have sinned. But the godly sorrow for sin is a different thing altogether. David in Psalm 51 said, I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me. A complete contrast to those three. His sorrow had God in the midst of it. His relationship with God, his feelings. He wanted his feelings to be like God. The Ninevites had this persevering repentance. Forty days, that initial time period. Forty days of being clothed with sackcloth, sitting in ashes. The animals, if you were to look out at the fields, you would see animals covered with sackcloth. That this all-encompassing attitude that lasted, that was persevering of repentance. Do we, as a New Testament believer, is that part of the sign to God that, that we are, we really believe what we say we believe because we repent 
on a daily basis. Reformation, thirdly, or sanctification. Mm -hmm. That progress in personal holiness, growth in grace, growth in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the activity, mm -hmm. but that desire, that desire to know Him. That desire to putting in place all those those outward things that will enable us to to walk in the light as he is in the light uh, proactively new reformations every day no matter if people call us a legalist or not we want to mm -hmm. we're very jealous for that maintaining that pure and holy relationship with the Lord work fruit meat for repentance that that crystalline form revealing what the genuine metal is, as one writer says. How many in our society will do many, many things under the guise of religion, but actually cutting off from sin, turning away from sin in a comprehensive way? Isaiah said, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So see, it's, sin is a very inward thing, it's in his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God he will abundantly pardon. Mm -hmm. Fourthly, hope. You as a New Testament believer should have as a sign unto God that you believe what he says is hope in God. The Ninevites repentance did not spring from fear alone, but it was based in hope as well. Who can tell, verse 9, who can tell if maybe God will relent? The hope for them was far from being assured. It was, it was a little glimmer, but it was still hope. Escape was not seen as being impossible. They had that shadow, that ground of hope. And they, they knew somehow God would make a difference between a city that was penitent and, and cognizant of his uh, hatred against sin and his, his existence and a city that just maintained the normal business as usual, which for Nisiria, uh, Nineveh was very, very wicked. They had hope. Forty days. There's this, this respite for 40 days. Why would God give us 40 days? If God didn't have a little door of hope, why wouldn't he have just judged us immediately? I think there's hope there. There's 40 days. You see, they followed through on this hope. Again, we defined hope as faith in the future. That certain certainty of it will come to pass, but it's in the future, so we, so we call it hope, not faith. Do we have that same hope in God, that steadfast assurance that what he has said that he would bring to pass, that he will. Lastly, fear. Fearing God and keeping his commandments. Fearing God, not vogue today, obviously, but fearing God because we understand we don't know God who is infinite and majestic and awesome we can't know every single thing about him. Though I'm his child, though perfect love casteth out fear, yet there is some fear of God that ought to be there. The Ninevites feared God. Mm. They had this dread. They were able, by their repentance, that whole scheme of repentance, they knew how they had affronted God, and they were powerless against God. They relied on his grace. And so we too must fear God, fearing God, keeping his commandments, the whole duty of man. Mm -hmm. The Ninevites were a sign unto God that evidenced their faith, their mm -hmm. sign being the serious practice of that religion that they profess to believe. New Testament believer, what is our sign to God that we believe what we say. We believe what we profess. It's, 
it's a serious practice of these very things. Belief in God, repentance from sin, reformation slash sanctification, hope in God, and fear of God. A couple of closing thoughts. We do have a responsibility with regard to the truth. We do have a responsibility to what has been bequeathed to us relative to the truth. In our Wednesday night Bible study, we've just recently finished understanding that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In the Gospel of John, Jesus put it this way. He said, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Mm. He does not say that the light shine or don't let the light be extinguished, but very, very clearly be careful and take heed that that light mm. maintains its, its light, its truth, its glory. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In other words, the slightest little bit of shadow or darkness or grayness should not come in. We are accountable to this truth that he has bequeathed to us. We're accountable to God for that character of life that the Bible speaks about and that we could say he expects. God expects great things from the Christian. A reverential thought life. Mm affection, submission, love, commitment, dedication. If we take the Bible at face value, we know that every moment of every day that we are living, that the character that we're forming, that he is looking on our life, that he has this book, that he's recording everything, and one day we will be called to give an account of all things that are done in the flesh. At the very least, we know that he knows all things, he sees all things, and then there is this standard that the scripture speaks about of who we should be as believers. And it's not unreasonable to say that God expects that from us, especially in light of the fact that he gives us grace and strength to perform those very things. Lastly, the men of Nineveh, again, Jesus said, less privilege, less means, not a whole lot that they could hang their hat on. Mm. But Jesus said he commended them because they repented. And they're going to rise with his stamp of approval, and they're going to rise in the resurrection and condemn others. Can you imagine in this environment of the Tri-Valley area, if in fact that judgment happens and the Ninevites here will know that they are from Nineveh mm. and they will be condemning church folks who have this outward appearance but it's all hypocrisy and untruth. Condemning them. Well, I trust, I pray, I hope that there is no one here who would be judged by the Ninevites mm -hmm. as those who are not genuine, those who are not real. Let us be a sign like the Ninevites were a sign to the Lord and to others because of the genuineness of our faith. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, help us to excel in the very nature and character of what a believer should be based upon thy word. We humbly ask for increased grace, for strength, that these five might not only be resonant within our heart and within our life, but that, Father, they would be growing and expanding and deepening, that we might to the praise of the glory of thy grace. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.